Hello YouTube and welcome to the long awaited second episode of my introduction to the Elder Scrolls lore series. Just like the first episode, this long video has timestamps in case you already know certain parts of the lore or want to skip my intro where I outline how this video will be handled. That being said, this video will heavily rely on you already understanding the absolute basics of Tamrielic lore which I dove into in the first episode, so watch that if you're still a bit hazy on the details. Because today we are delving into some more depth, specifically we'll be delving into the countries and politics of Tamriel. I will talk about the countries present on the continent during the games and their political affiliation and their stances on each other. Specifically, I will be talking about the political situation on the continent during the Elder Scrolls Online in the second era, Elder Scrolls 1 through 4 in the third era, and then close it off by talking about the fourth era situation that we find in the Elder Scrolls 5 Skyrim. By the way, I won't be spoiling any questlines for the most part other than some backstories, but nothing about the content of questlines. So as a new player, you will be able to watch this and then play all the questlines while having an understanding of the political situation and not being spoiled on story details. Now, without any further setup, let's roll the intro and let's get this thing going. So, let's start chronologically with the political situation of the Elder Scrolls Online, which is at the same time the most complex situation of the three. If you take a look at this map I made, you will notice that Tamriel in the Second Era is pretty fractured, and I want to start with a little bit of history explaining how we got to this map. To give some very neatest context for beginners to this complex situation, you can skip the history part by going through the timestamps, but I think the history really is essential to understand the situation on the continent. Although I did talk about it extensively already in my video recapping the Elder Scrolls Online main questline, so if you watch that, this will be pretty familiar. You see, the Elder Scrolls Online takes place in the year 582 of the Second Era, but to truly understand the events leading up to it, we need to start in the year 577 of the Second Era, five years earlier. At that time, the Emperor of the Cyrodelic Empire, Emperor Leovic, a Reachman Emperor from the so-called Longhouse Dynasty, was ousted and overthrown by the warlord Varon Aquilarius, who led a rebellion against Emperor Leovic after he instated Dejar worship in the Empire. The Empire at that time consisted only of Cyrodiil, small parts of Hammerfell, small parts of Elsewhere, the Reach and certain parts of High Rock. It was a long way from the large Cyrodiilic Empire that the Dragonborn Reman Emperors had forged at the end of the First Era. That empire fell apart 152 years before the start of the Elder Scrolls Online takes place, and after the fall, a period of Chaos and Pretender Emperors followed, none of whom were Dragonborn, so none of them were true Emperors at that time. You see, back then, before the events of the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, it was needed to have a Dragonborn Emperor on the throne, as only a Dragonborn could use the Amulet of Kings, a divine artifact of the Dragon God of Time, Akatosh, to light the dragon fires in the Temple of the One. That ritual protects the mortal realm from invasions by the Daedra, as we talked about in my first introduction video. So, we no longer had Dragonborn Emperors at that point, but as long as nobody touched the protective veil between the mortal realm and Oblivion and destroyed it, Tamriel would be fine, which is definitely not foreshadowing something I'll be talking about in a minute. Anyway, after the fall of the Reman Empire, we had a period of infighting in Cyrodiil with many pretender emperors. Every province of Tamriel at this time was basically minding its own business as central Cyrodiilic command just collapsed. That was until the Reachman Longhouse Emperors came along, and for the first time since the last leaders of the Reman Empire made a somewhat stable empire for almost 70 years, which consisted of Cyrodiil, the Reach, parts of Hammerfell, parts of High Rock, and these parts of Elsewhere that they conquered. 
This longhouse empire was relatively stable until the third emperor in the dynasty, Emperor Leovic, managed to anger almost everyone in the empire by legalizing Daedra worship in the empire. That is when the aforementioned warlord, Varen Aquilarius, led a large-scale rebellion against him, overthrew him and then took the empire for his own in the year 577 of the Second Era, so five years before the event of the Elder Scrolls Online. He did this with much support from others in Cyrodiil, and to please the Cyrodiilic nobility, he also ended up marrying Clivia Tharn, the daughter of the High Chancellor of the Elder Council, which is a council filled with Cyrodiil's most influential nobles who have a hand in its government. This was all a pretty solid foundation for Varen's rule, but despite all that he inherited a weak empire, and since half of Cyrodiil still saw him as a conqueror emperor without a real claim to the throne, he probably saw the writing on the wall that the empire would not last long unless a truly legitimate dragonborn ruler would sit on the throne and would be accepted by everyone. Some of this was his own insecurity most likely, as most sources claim that his rule was stable and actually pretty well accepted by the people, but in Varen's mind the empire could not survive for the long term unless a dragonborn emperor or an empress with the dragonborn blood was on the throne, and in the end he may have been right on that in the long term. But there were two problems for him. First of all, the Amulet of Kings, the divine artifact which could prove one's dragonborn claim to the throne by having it light the dragonfires, had been lost for centuries. And there was the issue of no dragonborns having been seen on the face of Tamriel since the death of the last Riemann Emperor at the end of the First Era. So there wasn't much to be done about the whole situation. Now, to discuss a solution, Emperor Varen called together some of his most trusted and wisest advisors, among whom were Abner Tharn, the High Chancellor of the Elder Council, whose daughter he married, and the sorcerer Mena Marco, who would later become one of the most notorious necromancers of all time. They then discussed the issue, and out of left field, Mena Marco, who again wasn't viewed as evil back then, but rather as a trusted advisor, claimed that if they could find the Amulet of Kings, he knew of a secret ritual which could be conducted using the amulet. That ritual, according to Mena Marco, could make someone who was worthy in the eyes of the god Akatosh, Dragonborn. And Mena Marco assured Emperor Varen that after his mighty conquest of Cyrodiil and the Empire, Akatosh would definitely bless him with the blood of a Dragonborn if he presented the Amulet of Kings. Emperor Varen, not knowing that Mena Marco was lying and was simply trying to advance his own goals and the goals of the Daedric Prince Molag Baal, whom he served, fell for this story by Mena Marco. And thus he and four mighty companions went on a quest to find the Amulet of Kings. Together these five companions would go on a two year quest to find the Amulet of Kings while leaving the Empire in the hands of Varen's wife and Abner Tharn's daughter, Clivia Tharn. In those two years the Empire would not see their Emperor much and he and the other companions traveled Tamriel to find the Amulet of Kings and after a long and exhaustive journey they found the Amulet. They then returned to the Imperial City to the Temple of the One where they would perform the ritual which Mena Marco promised would turn Varen Equilarius into a Dragonborn, but when they arrived and started to perform the ritual, something went horribly wrong. Like I told you before, Mena Marco had been serving the Daedric Prince Molag Baal and had relied about the ritual and betrayed his fellow companions at that moment. His magics executed the ritual which instead of using the Amulet of Kings to make Varen Dragonborn, made it so that the protective veil between the mortal plane and Oblivion, which was still intact since the last Riemann Empire lighted the Dragonfires, was now completely shattered. According to eyewitness accounts, the sky then opened up and a massive magical explosion shook the Imperial City to its core, and all across Tamriel, mages felt strange disruptions. Some places around the continent even started to experience strange earth and volcanic activities, as the corruption of the Amulet of Kings echoed magical effects from the Imperial City all across the continent. At that moment, in the chaos and the magical explosion, which would come to be known as a Soul Burst, a word you will be hearing a lot in the Elder Scrolls Online, Emperor Varen Aquilarius mysteriously disappeared from the face of Tamriel, and Mena Marco and his minions immediately grabbed power over the Empire as the Emperor now disappeared. The High Chancellor, Abner Tharn, then decided to side with Mena Marco and also betrayed the now vanished Emperor, so his daughter Clivia Tharn could continue to reign as Empress and so that the Empire could be kept together and not fall apart under Mena Marco's mismanagement. And for a time this worked, as very little supernatural happened save for the Earth Tremors around Cyrodiil and some increased activity of necromancers from Mena Marco's cult, who were his minions. Now, the larger public was kept in the dark about what happened to the Emperor, as the quest for the amulet has been kept secret and away from the public eye. Clivia Tharn, now reigning as Empress Regent, was presented to the public as their ruler, while Mena Marco and her father Abner Tharn were the real power behind the Empire. 
This functioned for about one and a half years, during which Menomarco kept isolating Empress Regent Clivia Tharn further and further from her father's influence, eventually turning her to Dejar worship of the Daedric Prince Molek Bal. And he also isolated Ebner Tharn and marginalized his power as much as possible until he'd lost almost all of his influence in the Empire. And Menomarco now was the sole ruler of the Empire, with Clivia Tharn as his loyal puppet and mouthpiece. During this time, Empress Regent Clivia Tharn started to behave ever more erratic and started clueless invasions of neighboring provinces which almost all failed, but they led to the three big alliances of the continent, the Altmeri Dominion, the Daggerfall Covenant and the Abenard Pact to invade Cyrodiil to depose the incompetent Empress Regent and install their own ruler. Cyrodiil would soon be overrun from three sides by three large armies, with only the Imperial City and its isle that it sat on being kept out of the hands of the three alliances and still under Imperial authority. From there, Clivia Tharn and the Elder Council under control of Men and Marco tried to recall as many troops from the provinces as they could, and they tried to command what few legions they had left. But this situation clearly wasn't very favorable for Men and Marco. Which then led him to hasten the plans of his master, the Daedric Prince Molag Bal, which was to merge the mortal plane with Cold Harbor, his realm of oblivion. An event which would come to be known as the Plane Melt, another word you will be hearing a lot during the Elder Scrolls Online. So just as the great three armies of the alliances neared the Imperial City, dark anchors designed to facilitate the merging of the mortal plane and Cold Harbor fell from the sky onto Tamriel, releasing thousands of Daedric minions across the continent. One of the largest dark anchors appeared over the Imperial City and made it so that the city was overrun by the Daedra after a short siege in which it seemed that the Empress Regent Clivia Tharn had either been killed or abducted by Menomarco as her ultimate fate remains unknown and the Imperial City was then soon lost to the Daedra. Now with Cyrodiil in shambles and overrun with Daedra and foreign troops the Empire was broken and Tamriel was rudderless and in chaos. It's here when the main story of the Elder Scrolls Online begins and for your player character that's the starting point. And if you don't want to play the game yourself, but do want to know how the story continues, then watch my video recapping the entire main story of the Elder Scrolls Online. That video can be found in the description. But now, we're going into the politics. Because on a geopolitical level, we now know what we need to know. We have an empire in shambles, with quite literally only some remnants left. If you take a look at the map, you will see that other than a few pockets under Imperial control, there is very little left of the Empire. Central Cyrodiil is a war zone, where the three great alliances, that we will talk about in a bit, perpetually fight over the continent in hopes of becoming the force to guide its future. The few Imperial Cyrodiilic cities left, which have been able to keep themselves out of the war, namely Anvil, Kvarch and Leowin, are now independent city-states, with Anvil ruled by a pirate queen who conquered the city, Kvarch under the rule of a religious order of the hour and the city's count, Carolus Aquilarius, the nephew of the former now lost emperor, and Leowin is ruled by a council of three powerful people and a count. That which formerly still calls itself Imperial Land are these three small pockets of land. One part in Hammerfell, occupied by an Imperial force under Septimathorn. One part across northwestern Elsewhere and northern Valenwood, centering around the city of Arenthia, occupied by Javadtharn. And finally the Kingdom of Rimen in eastern Elsewhere, which is ruled by the self-declared Queen of the region, Arexia Tharn. It's a bit of a question as to whether or not these lands can really be considered the Empire, considering it's basically just a Tharn family trying to hold on to some land. But they are the political entity still calling itself the Empire, and they are the most direct continuation of what was left of the Empire, so we will roll with that. That being said, without the Empire, politically Tamriel during this period is dominated by the struggle between the three great alliances of the continent. The Daggerfall Covenant, the Avenard Pact and the Altmeri Dominion. As you can see on the map, they don't control everything, as there are quite a few independent states left, but they are the dominant three great powers. And for a first time playthrough of the Elder Scrolls Online, you'd want to know a thing or two about these factions. So let's cover a short bit of history for each and then see geopolitically who their friends are and who they are at conflict with. Let's start with the Daggerfall Covenant. The Daggerfall Covenant is in essence an alliance between the kingdoms of Hyrok, the kingdoms of Northern Hammerfell and the kingdom of Orsinium of the Orcs. It's by far the alliance which is the furthest away from Cyrodiil, which is why this part of the map, the place called Cracklorn in the Elder Scrolls Online, I call it Light Blue, because while this area is not occupied by the Covenant, it is de facto controlled by it, because the Daggerfall Covenant supply lines go through this area. So while they don't have any civilian administration here, in most of the area they have control over it militarily. Now, the first form of this alliance came together during the days of the Longhouse Emperors, which I mentioned earlier. 
During the military campaigns of the first Longhouse Emperor, the Emperor attempted to conquer High Rock. Now, High Rock is a place splintered into many small and large kingdoms, dukedoms and vassals. One of the sayings that we keep hearing throughout the games is that in High Rock you basically just need to find an empty hill and proclaim yourself king, and then you are a king. Now, that says something about how fractured this province is, and generally these kingdoms and dukedoms and everything in between have always endlessly quarreled and warred with each other, which is why the emperor probably assumed it to be an easy target. Well, he was wrong, because when he invaded after initial successes, he was driven back by the combined might of High Rock's largest kingdoms, all of whom then formalized this makeshift alliance into the Daggerfall Covenant, or at least the first Daggerfall Covenant, which at that point was basically just a formalized agreement between the kingdoms of High Rock that, hey, if another foreign power ever tries to conquer us, we have each other's backs, right? And have each other's backs they did. Because even though the first Daggerfall Covenant started out as an alliance against foreign powers, there was far more cooperation and good vibes in the region than was the norm before. And when several decades after the formation of the First Covenant, 15 years before the start of the Elder Scrolls Online, King Emmerich of Weyrest angered another king in the north by not marrying his daughter but marrying some other king's daughter, you know, typical noble stuff, the alliance actually held. And not only that, because when the angry king who was named Ranser proved himself an aggressor by attempting to break the peace in High Rock by trying to invade Emmerich's kingdom of Weyrest in revenge, the other kingdoms of High Rock actually came to Emmerich's aid. And not only that, because at this moment the greater Daggerfall Covenant, the one that we see in the game, was born. As it turned out that the girl that Emmerich had ended up marrying was the daughter of the King of Sentinel in Northern Hammerfell. This Redguard King then also decided to help out against the aggressor. And as they were whooping Ranser's forces, it also turned out that the Orc clans from Northern High Rock decided to raid Ranser's kingdom in the north, just because he left it lightly defended and there was loot to be gained. Now, Emmerich then struck a deal with the Orcs, as they would get their own officially recognized land to build their own kingdom on, something that they hadn't been able to do for a long while, if they helped out in the war effort. And the Orcs quite liked that deal. So after King Ranser was stopped, an alliance was formed between the original Daggerfall Covenant, the kingdoms of Northern Hammerfell and the kingdom of Orsinium, which then became the Greater Daggerfall Covenant. Their credo became to foster peace and prosperity between the different lands and races of Tamriel. And when Varen Aquilarius ousted the last Longhouse Emperor and founded his empire in Cyrodiil, much of the same ideals, the Empire and the Greater Daggerfall Covenant actually became great chums, as both vied for a return to times of peace, unity and prosperity, like the times of the Riemann Empire. It's because of this that in the game you will see some Daggerfall Covenant NPCs claiming that they are the rightful rulers of Cyrodiil because they shared Varen Aquilarius' ideals, had treaties with him, and they are simply doing the right thing by trying to revive the Empire and purge it clean of the Tharn family who has poisoned the Empire with Deja worship and tyranny. And then they aim to put Emmerich, the King of Weyrest and now High King of the Covenant, on the throne of Cyrodiil as an Emperor of a Third Empire. Great stuff, but not everyone agrees with them, of course. Two whole alliances, actually. And we will get to that in a bit, but first let's talk a bit more about the Daggerfall Covenant's geopolitical situation. I won't talk too much about the internal politics and unstable regions, as in some cases those are spoilers for questlines, and that would make this video three days long. But what I can say is that it seems that the Covenant upholds generally okay relationships with most of the independent kingdoms of Hammerfell. Now, just a little disclaimer, we don't know an awful lot about this area, as it may be the setting of a future DLC, so they keep it purposefully vague what it's all about, but there doesn't seem to be any nasty neighborly relationships. And trust me, there are situations where the parts of provinces who are not part of an alliance are not as friendly or neutral as the independent kingdoms, which is of course foreshadowing again for some of the other alliances. Now, a final note to say about this region is that the independent kingdoms seem to be neutral. Uh, the only place in this entire region which we can visit here is Hughesbane, which is essentially a pirate haven and is neutral in the conflict. But we don't really know much about the rest of the area, but they are neutral so far in the little lore that we have, unless Xenomax changes that in a future DLC, so that might outdate this video. Something else you need to know is that the Sistress Isles, which have long since been a Breton colony of High Rock, are nominally a part of the Daggerfall Covenant, but because they are so far away and isolated from the continent, they don't have a lot to do with the war effort. And because of this and their isolated status, they were even a location for peace talks in one of the recent DLCs. 
That said, it's now time to talk about the second alliance, the Altmeri Dominion. The first Altmeri Dominion to be precise, because this is not the same Dominion that we see in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. That's the third Altmeri Dominion that we will talk about later in this video. Even though it largely comprises of the same lands, the Somerset Isles, Valenwood and elsewhere, these are two very different countries. Now, what's important to know in terms of history for the first Altmeri Dominion is a little bit of personal history of their leader, Queen Irene, and a little history on why before the Dominion was formed, Valenwood and elsewhere were having the exact opposite of a great time until the Altmer of the Somerset Isles came to their aid, which then led to forming the Dominion. Let me explain, and we'll start with the story of Queen Irene. Queen Irene was born in the year 555 of the Second Era as the daughter of the King of the Somerset Isles, just 27 years before the start of the Elder Scrolls Online, making her actually one of the younger High Elves that we can meet in the games. Anyway, she was raised to become Somerset's Queen, although she would often skip on her studies and disappear, sometimes for days at a time. And then, nine years before the events of the Elder Scrolls Online, she vanished completely from the Isles without any notice. This would lead to the Somerset Isles presuming her dead and her brother Naaman being raised to take her place as ruler. However, when their father, the king, died, suddenly Iron reappeared in the Somerset Isles after seven years of traveling across Tamriel undercover, traveling anywhere from Skyrim to Blackmarsh. But when her father died, Iren returned to claim her title as heiress to the throne, something not particularly enjoyed by her brother Naaman, which is actually a major plot point in the Elder Scrolls Online's Altmeri Dominion questline. But regardless of any internal feuds, Irene became queen of the Somerset Isles and almost immediately started forging alliances trying to establish an Altmeri dominion. Eventually she succeeded and she made it so that the Elden Accord got signed, which is the treaty binding the Somerset Isles, Valenwood and the Elsewhere Confederacy together in the Altmeri dominion. You see, during her travels across the continent, she reportedly saw the chaos that Tamriel had become after the fall of the Riemann Empire. And when the Soul Burst happened and what was left of the Empire was consumed by Daedra worship, Irene vowed to right the wrongs of Tamriel, as in her view, the wise and long-living elves had to help the humans of the continent get back on the right path. Through bloody conquest, of course. Sometimes even calling the humans children whose course needed to be corrected. However, it's important to know a thing or two about the situation that both Elsewhere and Valenwood found themselves in prior to joining Queen Irene's Altmeri Dominion. You see, both joined the Dominion after Somerset had helped them solve some key issues that they were dealing with. Because just a few years prior to our playtime in the Elder Scrolls Online, Valenwood was actually locked in a hundred year bloody civil war between the relatively progressive forces of the current king, King Aradon Camoran and his more conservative cousin, Galthior Camoran. These two and their aligned forces fought over the future of Valenwood, with their prime disagreement laying in how strict Bosmer religious practices of the Green Pact should be. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's what you need to know for now. Anyway, Galthior was looking increasingly like the party who would win the war as he got military support from Cyrodiil and the then Longhouse Emperor Leovig. But the tide of the war was overturned when the new Queen of Somerset, Irene, sent High Elf troops to relieve the war effort of King Aradon Camoran, leading to Aradon winning the Civil War and a strong bond being forged between the Somerset Isles and Valenwood, a bond which would soon prompt Valenwood to join the Altmeri Dominion. That being said, the case of Elsewhere is quite similar, but instead of a civil war, the kingdoms of the Elsewhere Confederacy were being ripped apart by the Knaten flu. You see, during the time of Iran's father's reign, the Knaten flu, one of Tamriel's worst plagues ever, swept across the continent, and the Khajiit were hit particularly hard and long by this plague. Despite the best efforts of Elsewhere's main, Akus Ri, and his political speaker, Lord Garish Ri, who are essentially the leaders of Elsewhere, the situation looked dire, and no place in Elsewhere didn't have a lot of losses and death. In addition to that, there weren't enough supplies, medicine and healers, so the main and his speaker appealed to the other provinces to help elsewhere in their hour of need. And the Somerset Isles, under Iran's father, answered the call by sending a wealth of medicinal supplies, food and hundreds of Old Mary healing masters. This allowed elsewhere to stall the plague and eventually get completely rid of it. And while they were grateful, most Khajiit were acutely aware that help from the King of Somerset usually meant that they would need to enter into an alliance with him. Well, he never asked for an alliance, but his daughter, Queen Irene, did appeal to Elsewhere to join her forming Altmeri Dominion. And Lord Garish Ri, speaker to the main with the main's blessing, then decided to aid Irene and signed the Elden Accord, meaning that Elsewhere joined the Dominion. The alliance is pretty much dominated by the Somerset Isles as the prime power among the three with the most influence, leading to Queen Irene becoming the queen of the alliance. 
Ironically, the people of both sides aren't super happy with the alliance as the Bosmer of Valenwood and the Kashid of Elsewhere are both afraid that the Altmer will come to dominate too much and will disregard their needs, while the people of Somerset are actually afraid that the Bosmer and the Kashid will try to use them for their good. Basically, the thing keeping the alliance together seems to be the goodwill between the leaders, Queen Irene, King Aaron Camorin, and the Speaker Lord Garrus Re and the Main, as the people of the provinces often need convincing, while the leaders get on pretty well. By the way, it's pretty important to understand the internal workings of elsewhere at this time and why it's the main and his speaker, Lord Garris Ree, who signed the accord. You see, the main is essentially elsewhere's leader by name, but is more of a spiritual figure, while the speaker of the main is the true political power. They work together, and in the case of Garris Ree and Akus Ree, they are lifelong friends, but generally spiritual things are handled by the main and political things are handled by the speaker of the main, making the speaker the de facto leader of elsewhere in a political sense, although he is generally expected to take a bit of a neutral role, just like the main, as elsewhere's internal politics tend to be convoluted and full of strife, but they are representatives of the Khajiiti people as a whole, and in the absence of real authority in the province, it was as them, and not the kings and queens of elsewhere, to sign the Elden Accord joining the Altmeri Dominion. As Elsewhere itself or the Elsewhere Confederacy, when we start playing, doesn't really exist anymore, as Elsewhere was utterly devastated by the Knaten flu. You see, many places in Elsewhere are left without a ruler when the game starts. The north of the province is controlled by imperial remnants who established themselves during the time of the Longhouse Emperors when Elsewhere was suffering terribly under the Knaten flu because the Longhouse Emperors then capitalized on this weakness by invading the north of the province. With Eurexia Tarn conquering the Kingdom of Rimen, placing an imperial remnant in the north. Meanwhile, in the south of Elsewhere in Sensual, the opposite happened as that city which has been hit so hard by the Knaten flu that all their rulers had died had descended into complete lawlessness, which ruled in its streets as people panicked over the flu, and according to some, the city itself faced a threat to its existence, as pirates and drug lords controlled what was left. Some Khajiit in the city then appealed to other provinces for help, just like the main and his speaker had done. However, instead of the Old Mary Dominion, it was Emperor Varen Aquilarius, then just freshly crowned emperor after ousting the Longhouse Emperor Leovic, who responded to the call for aid by sending an imperial legion to help restore order. But this wasn't an occupation force like the Longhouse Emperors would have sent, because Farron sent a legion of builders and medics, which helped restore the order in the city. I mean, seriously, shout out to their commander, General Merrick Renmus, who refused to be recalled by Empress Regent Clivia Tharn, as he didn't see her as a legitimate ruler, suspecting her of having had a hand in the murder of the Emperor. Rather, he stayed behind to protect the city of Sensual and continue the rebuilding efforts, only being willing to be recalled to Cyrodiil by a legitimate emperor. And in Sensual, instead of becoming an imperial despot like Eurexia Tharn in Rimen, this general actually helped identify Khajiit community leaders in the rebuilding city and then set up a city council to rule the city. And from that moment on, when the council started functioning, he actually started answering to them instead of becoming a military dictator himself. So, I mean, shout out to this dude. He's a real one. While the Khajiit were very distrustful of the 13th legion at first when they arrived by the time of the Elder Scrolls Online, these imperial soldiers are actually accepted by the Khajiit and the Khajiit actually lovingly call them the Shields of Sensual. What were we talking about again? Right, elsewhere not existing. Because Rimen is under an imperial despot, Sensual is an independent state with its defense guaranteed by the Shields of Sensual, and many other kingdoms are still poor, rebuilding themselves, and not really in any state to play at geopolitics. So while they are all nominally part of the Altmeri Dominion, except for Rimen and Sensual, they mostly need help instead of being able to provide it to anyone. For example, the Kingdom of Orcrest is in complete disarray as a new play grips the city. So yeah, that's why elsewhere's kings and queens did not sign the Elden Accord, but it was rather the main and his speaker who signed the Elden Accord, hoping partly for more assistance for elsewhere in rebuilding itself. And to be fair, the Altmeri Dominion under Queen Irene does help the province of elsewhere, as Lord Garris Ree, the speaker of the main, leads the elsewhere defense force, which aims to solve the internal problems of elsewhere, and that defense force is supplied and aided by the Altmeri Dominion. And that's basically the current situation of the Dominion summed up. Right now, it wars with the two other alliances over the continent and has its own share of internal troubles, many of them which you will be dealing with in the different zone stories. Now, last but not least, let's talk about the final alliance of the three, the Ebonheart Pact, and according to many, the most interesting alliance. Because this alliance is made up of parts of Skyrim, parts of Morrowind and parts of Blackmarsh. And you may say, well, why is that interesting? Well, because unlike the other alliances made up of nations which have cooperated in the past, these three partners have a history of absolutely hating each other. 
The Dark Elves of Morrowind and the Nords of Skyrim have basically been warring with each other since the time immemorial, and the Dark Elves have basically, also since forever, raided Black Marsh to capture Argonians to use as slaves, which obviously doesn't go well with most Argonians. So these three are the most unlikely partners you will ever see, and yet they came together, which is two prime reasons. One, a common enemy, and two, the political genius of Eastern Skyrim's king, King Joran, the leader of the Ebonheart Pact. You see, 10 years before the start of the Elder Scrolls Online, snow demons from the continent of Akavir invaded Tamriel from the north, starting by raiding the Nords of Skyrim and looting the province. Joran and his brother actually mounted a competent defense at Riften after the snow demons had burned the city of Windhelm to the ground. But instead of trying to take a well defended Riften, the Akaviri decided to instead turned to Morrowind, so the Akaviri invasion force bypassed Riften, entering Morrowind, hoping to raid and loot there as well, assuming that the Nords would be all too happy to let them go into Morrowind and burn their ancestral enemies down. Well, the Nords under Joran were particularly not happy with the Akaviri burning down their own towns, and actually went after them into Morrowind as a revenge, making it so that the Akaviri were now stuck between a very angry Nordic army and an equally angry Dunmar army. And then, in the heat of battle, suddenly an Argonian force from Blackmarsh flanked the Akaviri from the south. You see, the histories, the creators and leaders of the Argonian people, as talked about in the first introduction video, foresaw that if the Nords and the Dunmer would lose this fight, the Akaviri demons would attempt to destroy Blackmarsh as well, so they instructed the Argonians to nip this one in the bud and then help in the ongoing conflict. This gave these three parties, which haven't particularly enjoyed each other's company since the start of history, a common enemy. And then when the enemy was repelled, the diplomatic skills of King Joran of Eastern Skyrim, combined with some pragmatism from the Living Gods, the Tribunal of Morrowind, and goodwill from the Argonians, led to the signing of an official mutual defense treaty between the three unlikely partners, and they called it the Ebonheart Pact. This pact is constantly facing internal strife, as none of the partners seem particularly happy to amend past wrongs. For example, the Dark Elves of Morrowind agreed to outlaw slavery of pact races, so Nords and Argonians would no longer be enslaved, something that Dunmer slave owners weren't particularly happy about when they lost a lot of their slaves. But with Joran as its leader, who was a skilled diplomat and constantly put out fires, the Alliance was able to hold out for more than a decade, into the time of the Elder Scrolls Online, when the erratic behavior of Empress Regent Clivia Tharn and her descent into Deja worship angered the leaders of the pact, and they then decided to invade when the Altmeri Dominion and the Daggerfall Covenant invaded Cyrodiil, mainly because they didn't want to be subjugated by either of these factions, realizing that whomever controlled Cyrodiil would be in a prime position to conquer the rest of Tamriel. And these three unlikely partners each didn't want to be controlled by the other alliances, so the mutual defense treaty that they called the Emmenhard Pact then became a proper alliance and they invaded Cyrodiil together with the other great powers. However, as you can see on the map, unlike the other alliances, none of the provinces of the pact completely joined the alliance. Skyrim is divided in three political entities, Morrowind has a large peninsula not part of the alliance, and most of Blackmarsh straight up didn't join, with only the northern and southern Argonian tribes joining. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at these cases, which are important to understand for some of the questlines in the game. First let's talk about Black Marsh. Black Marsh is a really simple story. Except for the Hist, there isn't really any central authority in most places. Some cities have a central rule, but especially in the deep swamps in the province's center, they are mainly populated by independent Argonian tribes. And while the relatively well-organized tribes of the north decided to join, the tribes in the swamp stayed neutral and kept to themselves, not interested in the geopolitical goings-on of Tamriel. The tribes of the south in the region called Murkmire are much the same. While most actually decided to join the Ebonheart Pact, they did so only in name, as many of the tribes there don't contribute anything to the war effort, even though they are nominally part of the Ebonheart Pact. Now, the final stretch of Black Marsh is the neutral city of Gideon, which you see. Gideon is a curious case, as instead of joining the war effort, their ruler simply wanted to be neutral, despite being one of the war heroes of the Akaviri invasion, and not having a negative outlook on cooperation with the rest. But she simply decided to stay neutral in the war, which I respect. Now, up next is Morrowind, and this part that you see here, which is the Talvani Peninsula and the Talvani holdings on Vardenfell, they are lands ruled by the Great House Talvani, one of the ruling houses of Morrowind. And they aren't part of the Ebonheart Pact, because while the other Great Houses of Morrowind, even House Dress, a house built on slavery, 
was willing to give up Argonian and Nordic slaves, how Stalvani, not particularly willing to help anyone, simply decided not to join so they wouldn't have the hassle of having to help anyone and could keep their Argonian slaves. It's really as simple as that. They are still part of Morrowind and participate in the Great House feuds and the politics of the Great Houses, but they are functionally independent in a geopolitical sense as they refuse to join the Great Alliance. And then there's also this little spot which is the independent city of Necrom. Now Necrom is not governed by the Telvanni but is in the middle of Telvanni lands. It's a holy city to the Dark Elves and their religion and this has made it so that House Telvanni has agreed on making the city a neutral and independent city separate from their territory and guarantee safe passage for Dunmer pilgrims from other houses in the Abadar Pact through their lands to reach the city of Necrom because of its holy status. While at the same time the city is forbidden to join the Abadar Pact or house any troops. Alright, so finally let's talk about Skyrim, because Skyrim is divided into three different entities. The Reachman lands under the Reachman despot, called Art Kadak, who was the cousin of the last Longhouse Emperor, who has maintained control over the Reach after his cousin lost the Empire. And then we have the Kingdom of Western Skyrim under the rule of High King Svagrim, who remains independent and neutral in the war. And finally the Kingdom of Eastern Skyrim under High King Joran, who has joined the Ebonheart Pact. Now, this East-West division of Skyrim has been a thing for a far longer time than the founding of the Abenard Pact. That's a little over 150 years before the start of the Elder Scrolls Online. The High King of Unified Skyrim was assassinated. And then there was a classic succession dispute, as Jarl Freydis of Windhelm has a strong claim to the throne based on Skyrim's traditions, while Jarl Swarter of Solitude was chosen by the mood of Jarl, so that Jarl had a strong political claim. Instead of one of the two being able to claim the entire province, the outcome of this conflict was that the east and the west of Skyrim became independent states. And by the time of the Elder Scrolls Online, the east is ruled by Joran the Skald King, while the west is ruled by Svagrim the Wolf King. Both claim the title of High King of the Nords, and at least Jarl Svagrim is very suspicious of the east and is paranoid over losing independence. Refusing to join the Abenhard Pact out of fear of losing out and refusing to cede any land to the east. The east here controls the Pale, Winterhold, East March, and the Rift regions, while the west controls Hafingar, Hjalmarch, Falkreid, and the new hold of Carthalt, which is the hold on the border with the Reach, which is of course independent under the despot of Markarth. Which is why Western Skyrim created a new hold in the lands that they did still control. Now the interesting thing here is that while Whiterun by name is officially part of Western Skyrim, in practice Whiterun Holt is kind of a neutral zone as its Jarl has good connections with both Svagrim and Joran, leading to peoples of both kingdoms being welcome in the Holt. Now finally I want to say a quick word about Solstheim. We don't know much about the island during the time of the Elder Scrolls Online, as the Dunmar colonization of the island would only begin in the Third Era during the events of the Blood Moon DLC, and the Nords don't have a massive presence on the island yet either, according to established lore. It has no big settlements as far as we know, only the Nordic Skal are likely present on the island, who are neutral and isolationist and don't have much contact with the outside anyway. Although the island is a bit of a blank canvas, meaning that any future DLC may practically do anything with it. For example, we could have a DLC centered around Mirak, as his temple was already there by this time, even though Mirak himself was long since in Apocrypha. Now, we don't really know what's going on there, but we might see in a future DLC. Alright, so that's basically the political situation of the Elder Scrolls Online covered, which will at least give you a basic understanding of what's going on politically in the places that you'll visit during your playthrough. So now let's move on to the next part of this video, the Third Era, which is the time when most other Elder Scrolls games takes place, from the Elder Scrolls 1 Arena to the Elder Scrolls 4 Oblivion. Now the political situation in the Third Era is both very easily understood and endlessly complicated at the same time, because like we talked about in my first introduction video, the first Septim Emperor Tiber Septim simply conquered all of Tamriel, uniting the entire continent for the very first time into one big empire under the rule of Cyrodiil, under the great dragonborn emperor or empress on the throne who came from the Septim family. So all of Tamriel united at least on the outside, and while it's basically everything you need to know in order to understand the situation in most of the games, there are a few things I need to mention about the Septim Empire. First of all, the Empire's strength and centralization of power varied through the years. Some Emperors were strong and some were extremely weak. Under some the Empire was centrally ruled and under others the Empire only existed in name and the provinces just did what they wanted while saying they were part of the Empire. And there were several civil wars with either a province looking to gain independence or succession disputes within the Septim family leading to temporary divisions within the Empire. 
It's a long and flowing several century long history, but generally what you need to know is that the Septim Empire was generally a hands-off empire in a lot of places, allowing vassal states to rule themselves most of the time internally, as long as their leaders swear fealty to the empire. This means that despite, for example, the kingdoms of Hyrok all being part of the empire, wars between them internally were often part of daily life, with the empire trying to be a mediating force between them to bring peace, and the imperial legions mostly there for peacekeeping and preventing rebellion against the imperial rule when they were there. As the empire did impose taxes on every one of its vassals, and there were some empire-wide laws and institutions, next to existing local laws and institutions, and there was also a general drive to adopt the imperial pantheon of gods across the entire empire. There are some exceptions to this situation, for example in Cyrodiil the empire has a very strong grasp while in the deep swamps of Black Mars nobody probably ever even heard of the empire's troops never come there and the Argonians who live there don't really care for the rest of the world anyway. The same goes for Morrowind which was an exception to most of imperial law and was virtually independent save for some imperial presence here and there in governments and a few outposts as the armistice agreement between the empire and Morrowind which basically had Morrowind joining the empire guaranteed Morrowind's exception from several imperial laws like the outlaw on slavery but still making it part of the imperial economic zone and in name part of the empire, while also having a figurehead king of Morwin being chosen by the empire while retaining a large part of their autonomy and rule of the great houses. This exceptional status came as a result of a so-called mutual understanding between the living god Vivek and the first emperor Tiber Septim, who held a meeting together where it was decided that Morwin's virtual autonomy would be best for everyone, as Morwin and the tribunal had Dagoth Ur to deal with, which we talked about in the first video. This made it so that Morrowind only has a few imperial authorities here and there. The great houses retained their power and there was no pushback against Morrowind's religion in favor of the imperial pantheon. And of course, slaves were still allowed in Morrowind. So while saying that in the third era all of Tamriel is the empire is mostly true, the reality is that the empire at the time is complex and depending on the game you will be confronted with differing levels of imperial authority. But all of this fell apart at the start of the fourth era when the last Septim Emperor, the late and the great Martin Septim, sacrificed himself to stop the Oblivion Crisis and stave off Tamriel's destruction. The death of the last Septim Emperor led to a short few years where the High Chancellor we see in Oblivion, Oketo okay, so first hold, attempted to hold together the Empire, but when he was assassinated it proved to be a final nail in the coffin of the Septim Empire as it quickly started to fracture, a process hastened when the countless warlords and pretender emperors fight over control over the remnants of the Empire in a period that we call the Stormcrown Interregnum, in which there was no real central imperial rule because of all this infighting. Now, around this period there was even more chaos around Tamriel. Red Mountain, the large mountain in the center of Morrowind, erupted, destroying large swaths of Morrowind, an event that the Argonians of Black Marsh actually took advantage of by invading Morrowind as the Dark Elves were reeling from the effects of the eruption of the volcano. The Argonians then basically destroyed everything in the south of Morrowind which is still standing after the eruption of the mountain, all in revenge for millennia of enslavement. But that isn't all, because the kingdom of Orsinium, established way back at the founding of the Greater Daggerfall Covenant, was raided by armies of High Rock and Hammerfell, destroying the city and making the Orcish people once more homeless, despite the efforts of the Imperial Legions, which, without any central command from Cyrodiil, rushed to attempt to fulfill their duty as peacekeepers. But they were too late, as they were only there in time to protect the Orcish refugees as the city of Orsinium had already been laid to waste. Those Imperial Legions then protected the Orcs as they fled to the mountains between Hammerfell and Skyrim where they built a new Orsinium eventually. After this interregnum, full of chaos and infighting, the warlord Titus Mead was the last one to take control over the Empire and then establish a new dynasty of Emperors, the Mead Emperors, at the end of the Stormcrown Interregnum. With blood, sweat and tears he hammered the Empire back together as far as he could, conquering back Cyrodiil and the Human Provinces and establishing treaties with Somerset Isles, elsewhere Valenwood and Morrowind. Only Black Mars was permanently out of here by now, but they wouldn't be the last one to leave, as only a few years after rejoining the Empire, the Somerset Isles left the Empire, as the anti-imperial faction called the Thalmor assassinated the pro-imperial kings and queens of Somerset and established a new elven supremacist government. It was all down here from here for the Empire, as it slowly lost influence in Morrowind to the extent that by the time of Skyrim, Morrowind was barely part of the Empire, if only in name. 
Valenwood was quickly conquered by the Thalmor with lightningly fast military operations and governmental coups which led them to form a new alliance called the Third Altmeri Dominion, consisting of the Somerset Isles and Valenwood, which quickly became a Thalmor-run state as they started to persecute all those who were against them in Valenwood and the Somerset Isles. Elsewhere also eventually became independent after the pro-imperial main was assassinated and then a little over a hundred years before the events of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim when the moons, which are essential to Khajiiti culture as we talked about in the first introduction video, disappeared from the sky in the event called the Void Knights. There was panic in Elsewhere at this time because of the moon's disappearance and the two kingdoms of Elsewhere, Anaquina and Palatine, who controlled the north and the south of the province respectively, became independent client states of the Altmeri Dominion when the moons reappeared and the Thalmor claimed that they were the ones responsible for bringing them back out of kindness to help the Khajiit. Now, we don't know if this is true, whether the Thalmor were really responsible for bringing the moons back or whether the moons came back on their own or something else entirely was going on. Some have even suggested that the Thalmor were responsible for the disappearance in the first place and then conveniently didn't mention that to the Khajiit. But the result is that the Khajiit were so grateful that they were willing to ally themselves with the Altmeri Dominion as client states. Now, with a large elven supremacist hostile power to the south and a failing economy, the empire wasn't in the best of shapes as it now only consisted of the four human provinces, Orsinium and Morrowind, although only Morrowind in name as the imperial authority had long since waned there and the province had never returned to its economic status from before the eruption of the mountain. On top of that, Hammerfell was locked in a bloody civil war between the two cultural and political redguard factions, the Crowns and the Forebears, who both controlled half of Hammerfell. It was in this state that Titus Mead II inherited the Empire as he rose to the throne. Trouble everywhere and a severely underfunded military. And then, only three years after Titus Mead II took to the throne, his leadership was put to the ultimate test as on the 30th of the month of Frostfall in the year 171 of the Fourth Era, an ambassador from the Altmeri Dominion came to the Imperial City, giving the Emperor an ultimatum. The ultimatum demanded that the Emperor pay significant sums of money to the Altmeri Dominion and that he disband the Blades, the ancient organization and spy network which had once served the Septim Emperors which still operated across Tamriel. They also demanded control over the southern coast of Hammerfell and they demanded the abolishment of the worship of the god Talos in the entire empire. The Empire was in no shape to combat the Dominion, and unbeknownst to the Emperor, the Dominion had an ace up its sleeve, as it has the Orb of Vermina, the Daedric artifact which allowed the Dominion to scry all across Tamriel and spy on Imperial forces from a distance. But he could not accept this ultimatum, so the Emperor went to war, despite all the warnings of his generals. And after four years of bloody war, the Empire had taken a severe beating. All of Southern Cyrodiil had been taken, the Imperial City had been abandoned by the Empire and sacked by the Elves, and all of Southern Hammerfell had also been taken. At this time, the Dominion was trying to cross the Alakir Desert into Hammerfell and in Cyrodiil they prepared for an advance to the north. But slowly but surely, the tide of the war was turning. Redguard forces of the Crown faction together with Imperial Legionnaires managed to free a city of the Forebear factions, leading to the two factions finally reconciliating and now coordinating their war effort to get the Dominion out, while in the meantime the Dominion reinforcements for Hammerfell were little as the Dominion gambled everything on an attack in Cyrodiil. That attack on Cyrodiil completely failed when the Forgotten Hero, the player character of the Elder Scrolls Legends, managed to wrest the Orb of Vermina from the Thalmor's hands, making it so that the Empire, with a last ditch war effort after recalling the last possible troops from all across the Empire, managed to drive back the Dominion in Cyrodiil, after the Dominion could no longer see them coming through the Orb of Vermina. The Emperor then attempted to sue for peace before the Dominion could recover or could discover that the Empire used up its very last reserves. As a result, Dominion troops withdrew from Cyrodiil, the Empire likely received some war reparations from the Dominion and as a compromise the worship of Talos was outlawed across the Empire. The Blades were disbanded and the Altmeri Dominion would be allowed to keep certain holdings on the south of Hammerfell which they already controlled. That peace treaty was called the White Gold Concordat, which is a term you will often hear during your Skyrim playthrough as people being unhappy with the terms of the Concordat. But then Hammerfell refused to accept the ceding of territory. Especially now that their two factions, the Crowns and the Forebears, were finally working together and their forces were bolstered by discharged legionnaires left behind when all troops were recalled to Cyrodiil. These combined forces fought on, forcing the Emperor to renounce Hammerfell's imperial territory in order to retain the fragile peace with the Dominion, as the Dominion basically said, either make sure we get Hammerfell or we continue to fight. 
and the Emperor instead chose to make Hammerfell independent so that it was no longer his problem and it was no longer his responsibility. This made Hammerfell independent and the combined forces of Hammerfell managed to fight the Dominion to a standstill. They halted the Dominion advance and for five years held the Dominion force at bay and after five years of fighting along the same front and not making any progress, the Dominion finally gave up and signed a peace treaty with the now independent Hammerfell and that treaty is called the Second Treaty of Stross Mackay which had Dominion forces retreat from Hammerfell and likely, although we don't know because we don't know the provisions of the treaty, has some sort of provision in it that Hammerfell cannot rejoin the Empire. But despite a peace being signed, the trouble was not over for the Empire, as in Skyrim while the war was going on, the Reachmen of the Reach had ousted the Jarl of Markarth and had taken control over the Reach, installing their own king, King Madanak. Because these Reachmen, which are essentially the same faction as the Longhouse Emperors, all the way back in the Second Era, see this land as their ancestral land and they see as the Nords as occupiers. During the Great War they were working with the Empire to be recognized as an official imperial vassal and a separate political entity from Skyrim, essentially a separate imperial province. But before the process could be completed, an imperial commander who returned from the war and had gotten disillusioned with the Empire and then left imperial forces, helped the Jarl of Markarth retake his city, on the premise that the Jarl, when he was back in power, would officially allow the worship of Talos again in this city, because that was very important for that former commander. But that would go against the treaty which ended the war. Now, the desperate Jarl, who was exiled from his own city, agreed to that. And the disillusioned former imperial commander, who then formed a large militia, helped the Jarl to retake the city, taking it back from the Reachman and King Madanek. The name of that former imperial commander? Ulfric Stormcloak, son of the Jarl of Windhelm, who had taken a large militia of Nords and now retook the city of Markarth for the Jarl, under the credo that Talos' worship would be allowed there again. And they then imprisoned or killed the Reachman leadership and killed and drove out most of the warriors from the city, forcing the survivors into the hills and mountains of the Reach. These Reachmen in exile would from that moment on call themselves the Four Sworn and enact guerrilla warfare against anyone in the Reach, both Imperial troops and Nords, as a revenge for their ousting from the city. Now, eventually the Imperial Legion returned and masked the Skyrim after the war and showed up at the gates of Markarth. They, of course, found Ulfric there with the Jarl of Markarth and they were like, Hey man, thanks for taking back the city. Will you uh, let us in and, you know, restore Imperial authority? And Ulfric said, Yes, definitely, but you'll have to allow Talos worship to continue here, otherwise we will fight you as well. So reluctantly, the Imperial General or Legate or Commander or whoever was at the scene, without asking anyone from higher up, said, Okay, sure, no big deal thereby actively breaking the peace treaty which has ended the war barely a year after it had been signed. But that commander was wrong, as it very much was a big deal, and it didn't take long before the Thalmor found out that the Empire broke the peace treaty already by allowing Talos worship in the Reach. The Thalmor then presented the Emperor with an ultimatum, put down Talos worship in the Reach or resume the war with the Dominion. Faced with little choice, the Emperor then ordered the arrest of Ulfric and his men, and they were lifted from their beds and put into prison as Talos' worship was once more outlawed in the Reach, and the Empire was actively forced to start clamping down on Talos' worship across the province. Now, not only that, this incident caused the Thalmor to demand access to Skyrim with their justiciers in order to look for Talos worshippers themselves, as it was clear that the Empire was not upholding their treaty obligations in the province. So while the Talos worship ban was first mostly symbolic and wasn't really enforced anywhere, now it was enforced. Because of this whole incident, which was come to be known as the Markarth incident. Anyway, this all led to Ulfric being imprisoned for a while, and when he was released his father, the Jarl of Windhelm, has passed away, meaning that he would take the seat of the Jarl of Windhelm. Now, for a few years Ulfric kept relatively quiet, as the aging High King Islot of Skyrim managed to keep the province together and managed to keep Ulfric's political complaints mostly at bay, even though Ulfric already was covertly rebelling against the Empire, using his soldiers to secretly raid Imperial convoys and the like. However, King Islot died eventually and his son, Torig, was presented by the Empire to the Moot of Jarls, a gathering of Jarls all across the province which chooses the High King as a candidate for High King. 
Ulfric was also present at this moot, and while the moot was going on, Ulfric used his time to speak to try and convince the rest of the Jarls for the case of Skyrim's independence from the Empire, but his case mostly fell on deaf ears. However, his speeches did inspire Torig, who saw Ulfric as a war hero and very much respected him. Now, eventually the Moot chose Torik as the High King, and eventually everybody also returned to their own holds. But barely a few years later, Ulfric showed up at the Gates of Solitude. Everybody assumed that he had come to ask Torik to declare independence from the Empire, and some of his former confidants say that Torik was actually prepared to say yes to Ulfric due to his respect for him and the problems that Skyrim was facing. But Ulfric hadn't come to ask, and rather he challenged Thoric to a duel over the title of High King, an ancient Nordic custom, as a High King could not deny such a challenge without losing his honor. So Thoric accepted the challenge, a challenge that he could not win, as Ulfric had been trained in the tomb and was a very powerful and experienced warrior in his own right. Ulfric defeated Torik, and accounts vary, but the truth is that Torik was dead by the end of the duel, and the Empire then put Ulfric on its hit list, meaning Ulfric had to flee the city and the Stormcloak Rebellion officially began. That is the full historical lead up to the situation that we find in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, and as you can see, the full map of Tamriel is almost as fractures as the one that we saw in the Elder Scrolls Online era during the second era. So let's look at the political actors that we have, who their friends are and who their enemies are and what they want. Let's first look at the Empire. The Empire at this time consists of Cyrodiil, High Rock, Western Skyrim and this little sliver which is Orsinium. Now the Empire also nominally still has Morrowind but there is so little Imperial authority left in Morrowind that it's functionally independent and ruled by its great houses at this point so I no longer colored it red. High Rock, for all terms and purposes, is still peaceful and prosperous. It's the only province which hasn't significantly been hurt by the Great War, and save for an increased activity of pirates in the Iliac Bay to the south, which has seen some pirate raids to some of the cities of High Rock, like for example Wayrest got raided by Corsairs, it's still relatively prosperous and happy under the Empire's rule, even refusing Ulfric's request to join his fight against the Empire. The province is fractured into many kingdoms, all of whom are vassal kingdoms of the Empire who have their own domestic rule but swore fealty to the Emperor, and have imperial legions in the province to maintain general order and do peacekeeping, as the legions have generally always done in this region. Next up is of course Skyrim, the province that we play in, which is in the midst of a civil war and is divided into two halves, with Hafengar, Hjalmarch in the Reach and Falkreath choosing Imperial side, and the Pale, Winterhold and Eastmarch in the Rift choosing the Stormcloak side, with Whiterun as a neutral hold in the middle. However, Whiterun always chooses the Imperial side, no matter what the player chooses, and still allows the Legion to operate on its land even though it hasn't chosen the side yet, meaning that I colored it red for now. But the Stormcloak Civil War isn't the only conflict going on in the province, as the Four Sworn, who we have talked about earlier in the history part, are still claiming certain territories in the Reach, enacting guerrilla warfare and waiting for a moment of weakness in which they can retake the Reach back from the north. So to say that the province is in a bit of chaos is a bit of an understatement. Now, we don't know much about the current status of Orsinium, how prosperous it is 200 years after its refounding, how they think of the Empire, but we haven't heard of them leaving the Empire. And considering that the Orcs, according to the lore, still make up the vanguard of the Empire's elite troops and Orsinium was refounded by the grace of and under the protection of the Empire, as everybody else in the region originally wanted them out, we can be relatively sure that the relationship with the Imperial government is still quite good. Now, finally we have Cyrodiil, the heartland of the Empire and seat of the Imperial government. From what we've heard, Cyrodiil has recovered relatively well from the Great War. We don't know an awful lot about the situation in the province other than Stormcloak aligned people from Skyrim who say that due to the prosperity in Cyrodiil, the people of Cyrodiil don't understand Skyrim's plight, meaning that Cyrodiil seems to be at least doing relatively well. Although, what we do know is that the Empire keeps an absolute massive force of legionnaires at its southern border, ready for a second great war. According to some Imperial characters, that kind of force would be able to crush the Skyrim Rebellion in a matter of days, but the Emperor is unwilling to risk anything and take troops from the region, as a weakening of the defense force in the south could invite another Altmeri Dominion invasion. Because despite ending the war and having a peace treaty, the Empire and the Altmeri Dominion are absolutely not friends and are currently locked in an almost Cold War-like situation. 
We know that the Empire is using its secret service, the Penitus Oculatus, to try and ignite rebellions and other forms of sabotage in Dominion lands in order to weaken them. While we know from the Thalmor dossiers in Skyrim that the Aldmeri Dominion is using its agents to do exactly the same and try and cause chaos in the Empire and weaken it. And instigate and prolong conflicts like the Skyrim Civil War in the hope that the Empire will withdraw troops from its border to solve them. We know that both sides are looking for magical weapons to use against each other and are ever wary, both intending to one day win a definitive war against the other. Because if anything, the Great War by the Elves is called the First War Against the Empire. And that war was a stalemate and bad for both sides in many ways, as the Elves also lost a lot and, you know, promised a lot of things to their own people, which in the end they haven't been able to achieve. And that brings us to the Altmeri Dominion, because across from the Empire's southern border lies that alliance and its two client state in elsewhere, which are Anaquina and Palatine. The main Altmeri Dominion, as I said before, consists of the provinces of Valenwood and the Somerset Isles, which are both ruled with an iron fist by the Thalmor. We don't know much about these areas or how prosperous they are, all we know is that the Thalmor are the ruling party who are in turn led by some sort of council, as the Thalmor don't seem to have a singular leader or king, and the word council is dropped a few times in connection to their leadership. It's their goal to usher in a new Meretic era, so an era of elvish dominance on Tamriel, and they aren't particularly keen on sharing power with humans, and would like to end their dominance on the continent. And they also don't really like those others that they deem to be unpure, such as the orcs. The Thalmor came to power in a bloody coup, where they killed the previous leaders of the Somerset Isles and garnered the support of the population of the Isles by proclaiming it was them who stopped the Oblivion Crisis, not Martin Septim, and promised the people prosperity and freedom from human rule. However, that did come at the price tag of expelling and killing all non-elves on the Somerset Isles and persecuting and hunting down anyone, elf or not, who disagreed with them. Even abroad, as the Thalmor were responsible for the mass killings of refugee camps in the Empire filled with dissidents from the Somerset Isles who had fled. So, yeah, not really a good place to live as a political opponent of the Thalmor or a non-elf. That being said, Valenwood being in the Altmeri Dominion and being under the direct Thalmor leadership isn't by choice of the Bosmer in general, as countless pogroms against protesting Bosmer have occurred after the Thalmor came to power, and strict laws were imposed on the Bosmer population which placed High Elf rule on them. There are actually some sources claiming that there's a pretty large Bosmer resistance movement in Valenwood, or at least there used to be, which is or was supported by the Imperial Penitus Oculatus, the secret service of the Empire. That's about what we know of what's happening inside the Dominion, and truth be told, we know not that much. Uh, one thing that I personally speculated on in the past is that the Thalmor might have a problem with their own political supporter base, as they probably promised a swift victory over the humans, which ended in, well, from human perspective, a victory for the elves, but in elvish perspective, a victory for the humans, as they basically had to renounce everything that they had conquered, and they lost a lot of people and didn't even get all of their demands and possibly even had to pay the humans war reparations. But we don't really have any information on that. But we have even less information on elsewhere, because other than that we know that the two states of Anaquina and Palatine are client states of the Altmeri Dominion, answering to the Dominion geopolitically, but making their own internal laws, um, we don't really know much other than that. Uh, as such, it's pretty likely that elsewhere probably has a pretty sizable human population, since it makes its own laws, if the Dominion permits that, of course, and doesn't have... Uh, expelling humans as part of its you know treaties with elsewhere which made it client states and they might even still have trade relations with the empire but other than that we know relatively little of what's going on in elsewhere and even that half of that was speculation the same actually goes for Morrowind I mean for a province so close to Skyrim where we play we have relatively little idea of what's going on inside it we know that house Khalalu the in the past commercially and pro-imperial great house of the Dunmer, one of the governing houses, got expelled from the great council of Morrowind and got replaced by another house, House Sadras, which was previously a minor house that we know very little about and now fills Hlalu's place on the council. Other than that, we don't really know what's happening in the province. I mean, the, we know that the province is a far cry from its prosperous past as the eruption of the Red Mountain now 200 years ago is still showing its effects 200 years later, with many settlements barely rebuilt or straight up abandoned. And with its autonomy from the Empire and relatively little political connections with other states, with the Nords and the Argonians who aren't fond of the Dark Elves right next to them, and the Altmer don't really wanting to do anything with Dark Elves, as the Thalmor also see the Dark Elves as unpure, there 
there was little in terms of foreign aid to help rebuild Morrowind, meaning that they all had to do it themselves and meaning that they're still relatively poor at the moment. That isn't to say that Morrowind, divided into its great house territories, is a complete impoverished region. There are likely prosperous and less prosperous regions, but it doesn't really compare to the heights of dark elf culture from back in the first, second and third eras. Now, next we need to take a look at Black Mars, or Argonia as its rulers call it nowadays. The province right now is ruled by a party of Argonians called the Anselil, with its governing body called the Organism, which is filled with Anselil members. Black Mars under the Anselil is isolationist, they don't really want much to do with either the Empire or the Dominion, but Black Mars still should rightly be called the third great power of the continent. Because prior to Black Marsh's independence from the Empire, the Argonians had single-handedly driven back the forces of Maroon's Dagon during the Oblivion Crisis. The Argonians swarmed into Oblivion through the gates, forcing Maroon's Dagon to call off the invasion of Black Marsh and quickly close the portals in Black Marsh. When all the Argonians from the swamps and the outlands unite, they are truly a force to be reckoned with. And after driving out the forces of Oblivion from the swamps, the Argonians then claimed independence from the Empire, driving the Imperial troops out. The Anselil was then the political party which took charge of those parts of Black Mars which were well organized. They took an anti-imperial colonialism and Argonians first stance. And they aren't really Argonian supremacists or anything from what I've read. Uh, they don't even particularly hate the Empire or the Dominion and they have had diplomatic talks with both after getting their independence. The Anselil just dislike it when any other power interferes with Argonian swamps which they pu see as purely meant for Argonians. And see as colonialism when other powers put their wishes on them. So one of their first acts of business when coming to power was actually trying to demolish imperial buildings as much as possible to erase imperial colonial history. And they do kind of discriminate against Argonians who live according to imperial culture or other cultures. So it isn't all fun even if you are an Argonian. And despite not hating any of the great powers in the Empire and the Dominion, they do very much hate Morrowind. Which was demonstrated by the Anselil when they led the charge in the raiding of Morrowind as revenge for all the years of enslavement, just after the eruption of the Red Mountain. They also conquered significant parts of southern Morrowind then, which they see as part of the original swampland of ancient Black Marsh, and they just refused to give back to the Dark Elves after retreating back to Black Marsh. Now, the final region that we need to talk about is Hammerfell, but... Even from that province we know relatively little. We know that there's a division of the land between the Crown's faction and the Forebear's faction. Although we don't know the exact borders, so these borders that you see here on the map are completely speculated. That having been said, we know that since they came together during the Great War, these two factions are able to at least tolerate each other. We also know that Hammerfell as a whole does seem to reject the Thalmor and doesn't particularly enjoy the fact that they were being invaded a couple of years earlier. There was also some serious anger in Hammerfell about the Empire abandoning them in favor of protecting Cyrodiil during the Great War, but from some dialogue in the Elder Scrolls Blades and some lore sources in Skyrim, it seems that the Empire and Hammerfell, despite having some differences and they're obviously being a bit of a bad taste right after the Great War, do seem to be allied to each other, or at least in mutual defense against their mutual enemy, the Thalmor. As the Thalmor have demonstrated to be an enemy to all human races, especially more than 30 years after the war, in Skyrim it's been suggested, not least through open borders between the Empire and Hammerfell, that the Empire and Hammerfell have a relatively good relationship. And both are very wary of the Thalmor and the Altmeri Dominion. As a side note, this is also a likely outcome for the Skyrim Civil War problem if Bethesda goes with a Stormcloak victory. Even Ulfric says during parts of Skyrim that the Stormcloaks don't want a full out war with the Empire, they just want independence from the Empire. Meaning that even Ulfric sees the big picture and sees that the Thalmor are the true enemy and is most likely open to an alliance with the Empire if it means that the Thalmor stand as a common enemy. And that is the political situation as we see it in the fourth era. We have now covered all of the political situations from the games and some of the relevant history leading up to it. I am tired now. But in case you are not, let me recommend some videos for you to watch after this, which go into more depth regarding some of the topics that we talked about earlier here today. And by the way, in this video you sometimes saw my thumbnails on screen. That means that a more in-depth video on that topic also exists on the channel, as I tried to talk mostly about the basics in this video. Those videos are all in the description below, just like the videos that I'm about to recommend now. So, first of all, I recommend my in-depth video on the Anselil, as the new Argonian government is quite interesting and elusive, and I didn't really do them justice in this video, where I could only talk about them shortly. 
Second, I recommend watching my video on the Great War, in which I cover the entire conflict with a dynamic strategy map where I demonstrate the troop movements from both the Empire and the Dominion, and you can actually see some of the flow of that war. I also recommend watching my videos on the three Alliance leaders of the Elder Scrolls Online, Queen Irene, High King Emmerich, and Skald King Joran, as there I give some more of their personal background where I feel I could only really glance over it quickly here. Uh, that depth added is actually quite valuable, as I had to scrap a lot of it from this video, because otherwise the video would have been like a week long. And finally, I highly recommend watching my video on the War of the Red Diamond, where I use a strategy map and I explain one of the most high profile internal conflicts that the Septim Empire faced in the Third Era, so you can see what kind of conflicts were happening in the Septim Empire despite all of Tamriel technically being united. Now finally, I really hope that you learned something new about the Elder Scrolls lore today, and if you did, please consider subscribing, liking and all that stuff. I mean, that's how YouTube decides that this content is worthy, so if you liked it, do that. Also, huge thanks to my Patreon subscribers on screen, as they make videos like this possible. And now, I'm just tired, man. Let me go to sleep. See ya.